thank you everybody for coming today on behalf of the National Cryptologic Foundation. Thank you for joining our cyber chat today. You know, making and cracking codes involves math. All the way from addition and subtraction to organizing data and more. You know, some of the most famous code breakers in history were first mathematicians who used their math skills to influence wars, uncover plots, and identify traitors. We're very blessed today to have two of our great college students, Caitlin Kanabi and Lionel Morgan, and they're going to share some basic coding principles and, and really talk about some fun stuff. Caitlin is a undergraduate student at Purdue University studying cybersecurity with a minor in English. Her passions are and focus are on a digital forensics and cyber investigation. Caitlin holds multiple executive positions at the Purdue University campus. Lionel comes to us from the University of Maryland Global Campus, where he's a graduate student, and he studies cybersecurity technology in the pursuit of creating globally safe and secure internet. Thank goodness, Lionel, for many upcoming generations, and we need that. So we're going to turn it over to Caitlin and Lionel. Please, if you have questions, my cohort in crime here, Christine Harding and I, will be monitoring the, the, the Q&A. So please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A, and we'll pass those on to, to Caitlin and Lionel to ensure your questions are answered. Uh, so, uh, Caitlin and Lionel, over to you. Thanks, Mark, for the awesome introduction. As most of you guys know, since you signed up for this, we're talking about code and math. So the big question we're trying to get at here is how in the world does coding relate to math? And so in order for me to kind of explain this, I kind of have to talk a little bit about myself. I started high school, like all high schoolers. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no idea. My freshman year, I had geometry, and I hated geometry. I didn't get shapes at all. It was something I was never good at. But you give me algebra and let me fill in numbers, I could easily do that. But I was just not good at geometry. And so the semester was coming to an end, and... My grade was on the edge, didn't really know if I could get it up. And so my math teacher at the time, who's on this call, Mr. Keys, he said, if you complete a 10 plus hour Khan Academy coding course, I will give you extra credit. And I was like, I've never coded before in my life. I don't even know what this is. 10 plus hours, that's a lot, but I did it. And I loved it. I had never coded before in my life and I had so much fun. So the next year came around and I had to choose an elective at my high school. And I found out that my high school offered AP computer science. And so I took that course and I loved it. And I went back to my math teacher and told him, I am so happy you told me about coding my freshman year because I would never have known. And I told him how I wished our school had more coding options uh, so I could take more electives and just fill all my electives with like coding. And he was like, funny you say that because I was actually considering creating an AP computer science principles course. And I was like, do it, do it. He did it. And I took that the following year. So at this point I'm in high school, I have a pretty good coding knowledge. I'm no expert, but I know what I'm doing. And so some of the big questions start getting thrown out. I'm a junior in high school. People start asking me where I want to go to college, what I want to major in. I had no idea. Um, I liked coding. I was like, maybe computer science, maybe software engineering. And my dad asked, what about cybersecurity? And I was like, cybersecurity and coding, they're the same thing, aren't they? I always thought they were the exact same thing. There's no difference. And so I went on to Google to figure out the real truth behind this. And I found out they really aren't the same thing at all. And so... I was trying to figure out how I could get that security knowledge to figure out if that was something I would even enjoy. So I ended up finding a program at University of Maryland, and I applied. I didn't think I was going to get in. And it was a summer camp, and I got in. And so I ended up going to Maryland for a week the summer after my junior year of high school and just learned about cybersecurity and hacking and coding and offense and defense and all the things. And I walked out of that camp with – such a passion for cybersecurity and excitement for the field that when I went to go to apply to colleges, I only applied to colleges that had cybersecurity as a major. 
And that has led me to where I am now at Purdue University, Purdue University, which is the best choice I ever made. I'm so happy I'm here. And so to kind of build on this idea a little bit further, I'm going to give you a little bit of an analogy to kind of compare the cybersecurity and coding aspect. So we have this gladiator, and this gladiator has been training his whole life to compete in competition, and he decides to create some new moves no one's ever seen before. And so he creates these new moves. No one knows they're coming. No one knows what to expect. He shows up to the competition thinking he has it in the bag because no one knows what's coming. And he gets in the ring, and against him is this gladiator in head-to-toe armor. Not an inch of skin is showing. State of the art. And our gladiator shows up with all the new tricks, everything that no one's seen before, but he loses because he had no way to protect himself, right? So this is a great example of how cybersecurity and coding go together. Because you have armor, but armor means nothing if there's no human to wear it, right? So that's your cybersecurity. And you have a gladiator, but if he has no way to protect himself, then he's going to get hurt, right? So these two things can't exist without each other, but they still are definitively different things. They each stand on their own, but they work together. So that's kind of how cybersecurity and coding work. So now I'm going to go into a different question. So when you think of coding or hacking, what do you think of? Since I know you guys can't respond, I'll give you some responses I've gotten before. I've gotten tech companies like Google. I've gotten guys in hoodies in a basement. I've gotten crime shows. I'm a big crime show person, so I get that one. Another thing I get is those texts and numbers that flash across your screen in movies and TV shows and crime shows. And... For those of you here who don't know what this is, these ones and zeros are actually called binary. And what is binary? This just looks like math. (laughs) Well, binary is actually the language that computers speak, right? So we speak English. You give us a sheet of paper with English on it. We can understand it. We talk to each other and communicate through English. So computers do the same exact thing, but they do it with binary. So... On the right, here's two examples of some different types of code. On the right is some code we might see in Java language. In this specific coding example, it's checking to see how old you are if you're above a certain age or you're below 18 or above 18. On the left is something you might see more in the cybersecurity realm where it's creating a key. So you have a secret little key that no one can get into your system. But we're both, we're all, everyone here is reading this. We can read that user is 18 and over. We can read the image on the left. We understand this. So if I just showed you the ones and zeros before, and that's what the computers speak, yet we're telling the computers to do these things, how is the computer understanding anything we're typing in it if it doesn't speak our language? And now everything comes together. It understands because of math. So those ones and zeros can be added, subtracted, turned into letters, turned into numbers. And those ones and zeros ultimately make up what we're seeing on the screen right now. And so I guess in super, super general terms, the computers speak math. So (laughs) what we're looking at here is all the devices, your phones, your tablets, your computers that you're on every single day are doing math behind the scenes. And What this means is that even if you don't realize you're doing math, you're doing math all the time. And so now I'm super excited because I get to pass on to Lionel, who gets to kind of go into that further, how all these things we're doing every day and that are so ingrained in our lives are actually math and code, and we just don't know it. So, Lionel, I'm going to hand it off to you. Yeah. Thank you, Caitlin. Making and cracking codes became famous in war. If you want to start coding, that could get you through the door. So making the cracking code is known in math. You even coding when you're drawing polynomials onto a graph. Say so COD and cybersecurity, it involves something called binary. And that's composed of zeros and ones. If you want to start coding, then you want to start having some fun. I am Lionel Morgan, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. That was a great rap there, Lionel. Thank you. Absolutely love it. All right. So once again, I am Lionel Morgan, 
I grew up in a small town in rural North Carolina. I graduated from a small high school. I went on to graduate from uh, Shaw University to attain my computer science degree in pursuit of achieving bigger dreams. From farming to being the grandson of a sharecropper and learning the language of hard work, I went on to becoming a student at Shaw University, member of the Honors College, the Honda Quiz Bowl team, where the power of dreams was valued, to learning the language of computers. The power of dreams and education offered me the key to unlocking my life's picture that was cropped by social systems and generational programming. I want to discuss with you all the basics of coding and experience for gaining coding and cybersecurity skills. I want to start with a comparison of people and computers. We as people have our languages, such as Spanish and English, as Caitlin mentioned. And computers also have their languages, such as binary, COBOL, Fortran, Java, and HTML. People grow and advance every day and every year, just like computers are updated and advanced by Moore's Law. And Moore's Law states that the power of computing, it increases exponentially every two years. People have a brain. And it controls our information and our functions. Computers have a CPU, which is controlled through the binary functions, and it operates using circuits and transistors, which processes that binary information of ones and zeros. Computers, they also utilize memory. And within the memory of computers, you have programs. And the programs are developed using those coding libraries. And as people, we also use libraries to read books and to learn. And once we learn that information, our brain then stores that information that we learn into our memory. Another example, when we get sick or have a virus and you can't go to school, uh, you then go to a doctor for a health check or to get a vaccination. Then Later on, you start to feel better. Computers also get sick, too, from malware and viruses. And they also need cyber vaccinations, such as anti-malware and antivirus software to remove their sickness so they can also get better. Computers operate using the same concepts as people. Computers were created by mathematics, as Caitlin mentioned. Compute is derived from math, which means to calculate. So don't you all love those math formulas that your teacher just make you remember at the beginning of every lesson? Well, math formulas are algorithms as well. An algorithm is the process or set of rules to be followed when you are making calculations. In your geometry unit, for example, Caitlin, you use Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. Pi is approximately equal to 3.14. Area is equal to half the circumference of a circle, which is pi times the radius squared. And that circumference, which is the entire circle, is equal to 2 pi times that radius squared. They are all algorithms. When you are computing or doing math, you start with your formulas and you substitute numbers into those formulas. And once your teacher goes back to grade your work, if you showed your work, and after finding your solution, you have provided your teacher, your instructor, with an algorithm or a set of instructions to prove how you made your calculations. So do you know how to code? Yes, you do. Every day when you are doing math. And the use of math formulas help to create these algorithms. Uh, once again, computing and computers are derived from mathematics. And so your algorithms is also coding and programming. How many of you use the TikTok app? Well, app is short for application, which is also defined as a computer program. From your iPhone 12 or Galaxy S10, you can have TikTok installed on your smartphone 
And once you open the app, it connects you to that TikTok server and your phone then is the client. Well, in computing, this is the use of the client server model, which is important for us to connect to the Internet, connect to websites, connect to all apps that you use. So, for example, if you eat at a restaurant, you are the client, you are that customer. And once you make a request, your server serves you the information for food, which is that menu that we all love. And once you make um, make that request from that menu, your server takes that request and serves you your food. I want to go ahead and continue with TikTok to help you get an understanding of coding and cybersecurity. In your iPhone 8 or Android smartphone, you have technology such as dual cameras, microphones, speakers, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, SIM chips, GPS, and other sensors. Most of these technologies are connected, and it also utilizes TikTok's 15 million lines of code, the code that creates that app. There is code that allows your permission and allows TikTok's permission to access your photo libraries, access your camera, your microphone, your GPS sensor on your phone to access your location and also access your data to later generate ads and $50 billion for TikTok, all to profit off of your entertainment and data. In relation to cybersecurity, TikTok is federally and globally required to enforce information security controls and policy for securing your user data and also your privacy. TikTok was recently banned in India and Pakistan due to the lack of security and for immoral content. TikTok and most social media platforms are very aggressive and abuse user data by massively collecting and selling user data and not sufficiently securing user data and privacy. Currently, TikTok is a national security risk for the United States government. So you don't have to be good at coding or math to code or understand that $50 billion is a lot of money for an app. And once again, you do not have to be good at coding or math to learn how to code and start to create and work on apps such as TikTok. So I want to go ahead and kind of skip through this presentation that I actually kind of uh, forgot. But I did want to go ahead and touch on the experiences uh, to gaining coding and cyber skills. So let's start with coding. The most important thing for you to do and, and, and how I was able to learn coding was to pick one coding language. So you want to start with one coding language. Android is built off of Java and the Java libraries. Caitlin showed you all a Java code where you had the public static void main at the beginning. Uh, Apple is mainly built off of uh, Swift coding libraries. And also with websites, you have HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that controls that functionality of HTML, which stands for Hypertext Markup Language. And uh, that connects with your HTTP and HTTPS, which is that Hypertext Transfer Protocols to transfer uh, that information of, uh, contained in websites. Once you pick your coding language, you then want to pick an online coding course. My favorite is Udacity. Uh, I love their Android app development course, uh, but to each his own. And so you can also go to Udacity.com. A lot of their courses are, you know, subscriptions, so you do have to pay for them. And Code.org is mainly free. CodeAcademy.com, you do have free courses up there as well. And all are great. I would say code.org is more uh, relevant for youth and kids getting into learning code for the first time. So it uses a lot of animation, uh, things maybe like 
um, Frozen, if, if you all like Elsa and Anna, like my daughters do, and then you can go up there and kind of have Elsa and Anna moving at different angles, and it teach you the basis of coding. Then lastly for coding, I highly recommend you to think in terms of code. And so once you're on your cell phone and you get a text message, Try and figure out, you know, how you got that text message. Of course, you know, cell phones are connected to global uh, satellites for your uh, communication and cell phone provider. Once again, you want to kind of think back, okay, well, how did I get that text message? Text message operates through SMS. So that's a short message service. You, You would be able to learn how to program and learn how to code SMS into an Android app or an Apple app. And then you will be able to send your friends messages. And lastly, you want to practice, practice, practice. Practice is always the key. You know, we practice life every day. And so that's, you know, how you get good and get pretty much uh, familiar with life because you practice it every day. Uh, going over to cybersecurity, you want to pick an online computer networking course. To really understand cybersecurity, you really have to understand networking. So how does my computer connect to the Nepris server right now? How does my computer uh, connect with the Nepris server that also connects with the Zoom server and allows us to have this meeting right now? And how is my camera, you know, steady rolling? And how is my voice actually being transmitted through my microphone in which you all can hear because that's sent over the Internet? So you want to understand those networking principles from a base, and that will really give you a good understanding of cybersecurity. And courses that you can also look at um, to learn cybersecurity and networking, once again, is Udacity. Uh, That's my favorite, so I'm a little bit biased on that. And you can go to udacity.com, udemy.com, which also has free courses, and coursera.org which has a lot of networking courses and you would actually have to subscribe and pay for those courses. So on college campuses, a lot of college campuses in the country, one thing that a lot of cybersecurity clubs do. So any of these students, for any students out here, this is a good idea to start a club on your campus is you create a club, a cybersecurity club, and you meet with your members and there's a website called hackthebox.com. And they have these really fun activities you can do as a group. And so a lot of, there's actually like a college campus at IU and they just come together once a week and they do hack the box activities and no one knows any cybersecurity knowledge. So they're coming fresh and it's super, super fun and just an idea for any people that might be interested in cybersecurity and want to start a club. That's a fun thing to do. So that's a great recommendation, Caitlin and working with people will always help you to build knowledge in in any field. Just as Caitlin mentioned, uh, you can work with someone, get get your computer, get their computer, and and literally, you know, create a virtual environment. You don't really want to be hacking on a live network and just hack their computer, you know. uh, uh, You know, participate in a computer club. I was a part of a computer club, and I, I really found it instrumental to really helping me to learn more about computer science, cybersecurity, robotics, you know, a broad range of things. So other people will be able to teach you different things in this field, which which also connects uh, coding and cybersecurity. Uh, so uh, once again, I would definitely recommend you picking an online ethical hacking course. Uh, once you learn how to hack ethically, please do not hack a live website or domain of uh, being straightforward. You will go to jail if someone catches you doing it. And you want to learn Linux and Windows. And I would say from a command level so you understand the uh, hierarchy and structure of libraries and the Linux and Windows system as a whole. And lastly, you want to think in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, Just as thinking in terms of coding, you want to think in terms of cybersecurity to understand cybersecurity. Once again, I do want to use this as an example. So how can someone uh, pretty much, you know, manipulate their way into uh, this conference? Or how can someone, 
you know, capture uh, the data that's processing on my network and use that information to kind of move me out of the way. And then they start screaming uh, in this conference here. And so you always want to think in terms of cybersecurity. And once again, it's definitely great to practice, practice, practice. And that's all I have to say. And I will go ahead and pass it back. Thank you all. Thanks, Lionel. Thank you, Caitlin. We got a question for you. What's the difference between um, a coding course you pay for versus a free one? Do they both have the same value? So what are your thoughts? Caitlin, I, I know you guys have a really good uh, cyber club uh, environment there at, at, at Purdue. For some of these coding courses, uh, can you address the, the, the free ones versus the ones you have to pay for? Personally, I have only ever used coding platforms. I've never once paid. None of my clubs or anything have we, none of our classes have ever paid for a subscription to do anything. So I think Lionel is probably better expertise on this because he has. So very doable without paying, but I, I don't necessarily know. So I'll pass to Lionel. I would definitely uh, agree with you, Caitlin. Um, I would say, you know, starting off, please don't pay for any courses. Use YouTube and use Google to your advantage. I would say, uh, in comparison that paid courses are a lot more detailed, a lot more step by step. So it gives you that structure to learning coding. It gives you a uh, structure to downloading IDEs, which is integrated development environments and SDKs, which is software development kits. And a lot of those instructor, instructors, they'll show you how to download it. Uh, they'll uh, teach you your system specifications for being able to download and run those IDEs and software development kits. And once again, it will have that step-by-step structure of, you know, teaching you coding and, and really getting you up and running with developing an app. Uh, but once again, you do not have to pay for a subscription at all. I think there's a lot of information out here on YouTube and Google that you can access for free. Thanks, Lionel. I, I agree. Um, and I'll echo both what Caitlin and Lionel have, have shared. There's a lot of free resources out there that can provide, uh, some good, uh, fun, learning uh, opportunities. Uh, so check those out first. And in fact, we got a couple of links in the in the chat room to cyberseek.org, which will show you all the jobs available. Uh, students, there are over 500,000 jobs available today. And Lionel and Caitlin are going to get some of those great jobs, uh, et cetera. And so we really appreciate uh, being part of, of our community, and we hope you join us a- as well. Uh, are there any other uh, questions that we have from the students who are here. Okay, we do have one. What are some of the ways that you think that, what area do you want to focus on in your careers? So, Caitlin, why don't you go first? What kind of career are you looking for? Where do you want to start? I think this is kind of fun. So I'm going to give a little background about how I've talked. So high school, I was coding. So computer science is what I wanted to do. And then I went to Maryland and was like, cybersecurity is what I want to do. And then I got into cybersecurity, realized there's a lot of different branches of cybersecurity. It is not straightforward. So I gave my hand networking. Turned out, don't like that. I don't like cabling. I don't like connecting things. I don't like the physical aspect of it. And ultimately, the real reason, the deep down reason why I got into cybersecurity was because I'm obsessed with crime shows. (laughs) Super obsessed with crime shows. I think, like, the always the computer person in the crime shows is like my idol. And so a part of me was always like digital investigation, digital investigation. And then Purdue has an amazing program. Started taking those classes and was like, yep, zip. <laughs> so I interned in cyber investigation and forensic analysis, loved it. And that's kind of where I've landed and it's what I want to do. So cyber investigation, I've worked both cr- criminal and civil. So I don't know wh- which one, but I love both. So yeah. <laughs> How about you, Lino? Wanted you to talk about what your focus is going to be in cybersecurity. So my main focus, and Mark touched on this a little bit earlier at the beginning, my main goal is to create a globally safe and secure uh, network and Internet for upcoming generations. 
just as we use the TikTok example in the session, I feel like apps and uh, a lot of these programs are very insecure. And a lot of these programs, they have a main customer base and user base of kids and, and people, you know, uh, coming up in those generations. And so I really think it's important that we protect the kids in all aspects and really focus on securing social media platforms and the Internet as a whole. I mean, you still want to be able to surf the web and kind of get where you need to go and get the information that you need. But that is my main goal, to really create a globally safe and secure Internet for upcoming generations, maybe working with a DOD organization to be able to do that. But ultimately, my main goal is to be a contractor on my own and be able to go throughout the world and to be able to get these contracts and help different countries to uh, secure their networks. Thank you. Um, I posted in the uh, in the chat room a link to the cuckoo's egg. Caitlin, have you read that yet? The cuckoo's egg by Cliff Stoll. No, I have not. I um, have a book, so I'll definitely read it. <laughs> this is the very first open example of cyber forensics, basically. And the FBI agent that is talked about in that book, we know quite well, and he started one of the very first forensic shops uh, just up the street from us. So I think you'll enjoy that book. It's a quick read. We have a question here. Do you have to go to college for cybersecurity? The answer is no. There's lots of jobs out there that require just a high school education. Obviously, as if you go to cyberseek.org, it'll show you the level of education you need for these various jobs. But you can get a, a good cyber security job go with some certifications and if i can add to you there are also a number of apprentice opportunities either within government or in the private sector um, so those are other areas that students can look at as well um, and we have another question um, how much cryptocurrency and nfts are, are can be impacted by cybersecurity? i don't know which one of you want to take that that's a huge research field right now there it's so hard to answer that question because it's so new and in the same way cybersecurity is really new um, there is so many if you want to look at that some big like big research campuses they're doing a lot of research on cryptocurrency it's unclear as of right now but eventually just as all things there will be a hole and someone will figure it out but it's still a research process <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and once again, you do send information over a network, uh, just like cryptocurrency. It is sent over a network, and any information that is sent over a network can be intercepted and can be manipulated. Cryptocurrency mainly works just by the security of that system. Uh, it's decentralized, and it uses a lot of cryptography, mathematical algorithms to encode this information. So if someone finds out the key for that cryptographic system and cryptocurrency, they then can figure out where this money is going to and be able to access that as well. Oh, we have a, a question about what if I can't pay for college and really want to go? I also put a, a just a, a link in the chat room to just one source for scholarships, and that was after a real quick hit on the Internet of uh, uh, College Cybersecurity Scholarships. And just in that link alone, I think I saw close to – uh, at least uh, 50 or 60 sources for scholarships of, of various amounts. Um, and the reason for that is there's 500,000 jobs open, and industry wants you to get a cybersecurity degree. So there's plenty of scholarships out there. If you feel you can't afford college, please feel free to go on the Internet, search for these scholarships, apply for them. I had one person tell me that uh, the mother had asked her daughter to go to work uh, during the summer in between her junior and senior high school uh, time frame. And she said, okay, I'm going to stay at home and work. 
And her mom said, what do you mean? And she said, I'm going to apply for scholarships. And so she spent her whole junior summer working, getting up every day at 8 o'clock and going to work by searching and applied for so many scholarships that she was awarded so many that she was able to pick the school she wanted to go, and it was free. And her mom said that was the best summer job she ever found. Even though she didn't make any money during the summer, she made her co her whole college career at the end. There's lots of scholarship money out there. You just have to take the time and effort to go get it, and you can find it. I also want to mention, too, that there also are centers of academic um, excellence. I'm going to add in the the uh, web address for that as well, which are actually two-year and four-year colleges and universities that have programs in cyber as well. And that's actually going to be a topic that we're going to uh, address um, and talk more about on the 20th of April. So I just want to mention that to folks, too, that there, uh, again, as Mark said, that there are scholarships available, many through the institutions that are that are CAEs. So that's another research area um, for students to check out as well. I think we have time for one more question, and, and it's a really interesting for both you and Caitlin and, and Lionel, talking about cybersecurity as it relates to new technology, like in, in driving autonomous cars and 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 all of those aspects. Uh, have you guys been exposed at all in your college careers about talking about how to secure uh, that type of technology? I would go back to Java. Java runs on more than 3 billion devices now. It even runs in your car. A lot of our cars are, you know, controlled by computers and ECUs, which we find in cars. And so, once again, if you know Java and, and are learning Java and learning cybersecurity to figure out how to uh, manipulate Java libraries and uh, hack into cars, which cars also have, Wi-Fi in them nowadays. Uh, cars also have a satellite chip in them too, to where you have that series XM radio. And so once again, you really have to think in terms of coding and think in terms of cybersecurity, break down all of these technologies, and you can go out here to a uh, vulnerability database or open source network. And once again, you want to be ethical always, and you can figure out vulnerabilities too these types of technologies that are in cars and autonomous driving. So once again, you, you want to figure out, okay, well, that works on uh, 3D and, and, and radar, LIDAR technology. And so once again, if you figure out how this technology works, you can reverse engineer it. And I think, you know, with the Internet of Things domain and cars being connected to Wi-Fi, it really leaves them vulnerable. Excellent. Caitlin, have you seen any of this uh, work uh, in uh, trying to protect these new technologies? Yeah, I'll talk quickly because I know we're running out of time, but I have side knowledge. So Purdue has a Capture the Flag team, which we don't really have time to get into, but Capture the Flag is another great cybersecurity resource. Their competitions, like super fun. Imagine a Capture the Flag competition in real life, and it's just like that, but on computers. And we have a phenomenal top 10 in the nation team at cybersecurity. And our leader, three summers ago, he worked at Tesla. And Tesla hired him to just hack the self-driving cars. That's all he did all summer was just hack the cars. And he signed an NDA, so he couldn't explain it. But he told us that he's like, he basically just gave that nod, like, (laughs) It's and because we were all wondering if he really did hack it. He's like, did I hack it? Yeah. So I I can't say anything else. That's all he said to us. But that's the knowledge (laughs) I've had so far with it. Well, Caitlin and Lionel, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. Uh, I think if anything, the information you've shared is, is the great excitement in this career field, the, the broad aspects of this career field, all the way from forensics to, to securing the internet, uh, for safe things, all the new technologies that, that still need protecting. And so students, uh, this is an area of, of great growth and great opportunity. Somebody asked how much what you can make if when you go on CyberSeek, you'll see a lot of the entry, entry 
level uh, incomes are like $80,000 a year. So please go to that website. That'll share all that stuff. Uh, so on behalf of the National Cryptologic Foundation, Caitlin, thank you so much. Lionel, thank you uh, for joining us together today to share that, that sometimes math can get you into and out of trouble. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you.